Paul, we said it could happen. We weren't quite sure exactly how <laughs> things were going to plan out in this last round. Piotr Glagowski, in the round that we just covered, managed to win a drawn out real battle there against Christoph Prince and put himself in that speed where you're like, all right, I should probably be good for top eight. Not quite. So as it turns out, Piotr Glagowski paired against Christopher Larson, who has 27 match points versus uh, Glagowski's 30, meaning that he got paired down and they have to play it out. So the setting is, and we can head down to the match, uh, they're just getting started here as well. The setting though, Paul, is that Klukowski has to win if he's gonna make it into the top eight. When it comes to Larson's chances of top eight, well, there aren't any, so he's done with that. But there's a decent chance that he's playing for top 16 here, which has a big invite attached to it for the uh, for the season grand finals coming up later this year. Um, still trying to run the numbers to see if Larson is live or guaranteed or whatever it is that his chances are of that. But the focus here really is on Piotr Klukowski because he had to scrap it out to get to this point in the tournament. It's never easy, though. He's going to have to win one more round if he's going to make it into the uh, top eight. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this time and time again in, in various other Swiss tournaments where you win your second to last round, all you need is that draw, and uh, you look at your pairings and you get paired down. And, well, what that means is you got to keep playing and just just keep keep putting up those Ws. So Piotr has to play again. I'm sure a lot, of the, a lot of the viewers out there who might be big fans of Piotr uh, who thought he might have locked it up last round. We're going to have to see him try to fight through one more round for a slot into the top eight. Boy, it's never easy, is it, Paul? <laughs> no. Going up against Christopher Larson, too. Larson is on Jund Sacrifice. And, wow, he's had a really good weekend, I have to say, because, you know, zooming out a little bit, Jund Sacrifice didn't seem to be the choice coming in, but he has made it work, perhaps putting him in position to qualify for that... Uh, that season grand finals, we'll have to see. But uh, again, as it stands, the, the real prize here is a top eight finish, and that is in the hands of Piotr Glugowski if he can pick up a couple of uh, game wins against Larson here. Yeah, big castle Vantress off the top from Glugowski, keeping a two lander, but you know, he has an excellent hand. He just needs to make sure that he can develop his mana. Chris Larson, on the other hand, a little bit of a slower start here. And this is, when you see hands like this, this is kind of the reason why most people feel like the Reclamation decks have an edge in this matchup because Ooh. the the Jun Sacrifice decks can draw a lot of cards, but... That was a, a very nice draw there for uh, Piotr Glukowski. He, he's hitting all of his land drops and he was able to get that land off of the... Uh, oh, wow, yeah, this might, this might just be a, fair, a very quick game here because next mm -hmm. turn, we are looking at an explosion for six. Yep, and there you go. Explosion for six in the bucket here, and this is uh, this one could be over very quickly. You know, we've seen a different side of the Teamer Reclamation deck the last couple of rounds that we've been watching. The grindier, slower setup, counter spell, all of this type of uh, side of it. That is not necessarily how this deck plays out. It has a combo like element to it that allows you to do things like this just blast off a whole bunch of mana. Uh, you know, way early in the game. I mean, this is 10 mana available on turn four here for Glagowski. Like, come on. And that's the thing. Th th that is the reason to play this deck, because as we've seen, this deck is very capable of kind of winning those long, grindy matchups against a variety of different decks. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you can just get free wins, quote unquote free wins like this, where you go turn two Grow Spiral, turn three Reclamation, maybe mm -hmm. act with you in some way, turn five, blast you for six, refill my hand, next turn kill you. Right? Yeah, I mean, and, and totally. Th th this is what Piotr's doing here. And it's gonna be so hard for, for this Jun Sacrifice deck that's trying to slowly get you with two for ones to come back from just the sheer amount of raw card advantage that Piotr was able to put together off of that huge explosion. Yeah, these decks actually occupy two ends of kind of an interesting spectrum. You know, the Larson's deck really is incremental, right? It's like drain you for one, ping you for one, attack you for two, you know, sacrifice things, get a little extra mana, get an extra card, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Trail of, Clum of Crumbs is a powerful, but ultimately a little bit slow of a card. Well, on the other side, it's like, boom, right? It's like draw six, kill your biggest thing in one fell swoop. And that's what we're gonna see here as Piotr Glagowski has reloaded his hand. Interesting to see if Glagowski can finish off game one here. I think he's gonna feel really oh, relieved. There it is. What do you see? 
Oh, another ex expansion explosion? <laughs> yeah, that should do it. Yeah. You know, I was saying, you know, that he's going to feel really relieved about that, I think, because he has built this four-color reclamation deck really with the other teamer reclamation builds in mind, but he just drew the part of his deck that didn't have a lot of the reactive stuff. It was more of the growth spiral, wilderness reclamation, expansion explosion cards. And if he can just, uh, you know, sneak a quick win here, he can take away those reactionary cards that he doesn't want in this matchup and even improve it further for himself. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th this four color reclamation deck was basically, the thing is reclamation decks in general tend to prey on kind of the, uh, some of these like sacrifice mid range strategies. And so, I mean, if there was a matchup that Glagoski had to play in the in, in, for the top eight, I mean, it, it's gotta be either Jun Sacrifice or I guess, I mean, given his track record, other reclamation decks. Mm -hmm. That's right. He even drew his copy of Scorching Dragonfire here just to uh, add insult to injury to, well, effectively kill the Mayhem Devil. Yeah, and he doesn't quite have enough mana to get in for the full 18 points of damage here. So he's going to just continue just playing out of spells. It looks like he can probably run out an Uro here. And typically that's a pretty scary proposition, especially when there's an active Witch's Oven in play. Got to be concerned about cards like Claim the Firstborn. But, you know, he's got all the protection spells in the world in his hand with that Negate and Dovin's Veto in hand. That's right. Two copies of Claim the Firstborn in the main deck for Christopher Larson. He also has the other two in the sideboard. Uh, as we can see, though, none in hand. So that leads me to question then, Paul, what about Bolas' Citadel, right? We we have seen it be kind of an oops, I win card. Oh, there is a claim the first part again. I, I missed that. Uh, but at any rate, Bolas' Citadel, um, does it have the same effect in this matchup where he could just play it and be like, the game's over? Well, I mean, it's extremely powerful, but the trick is actually getting it to resolve. With a lot of these Reclamation decks now just playing additional counter spells, I mean, you're seeing decks playing up to four Mystical Disputes, up to four Negate Variants, Dovin's Vetoes. It's just really hard to stick. But if you do, I mean, we saw in day one, Bolus' Citadel resolve and just kind of win the match on the spot, win the game on the spot. So uh, yeah, it, it can get pretty out of hand. And I think here, I mean, Chris Larson, he, he was just really crossing his fingers, hoping that that claim the first porn resolved because now, I mean, he's gonna be in a lot of trouble. This Uro is gonna get, be able to get in for some damage, which is gonna make it much easier for, Gl for Glogowski to just finish the game next turn. That's right, so super tough spot here for Christopher Larson. A really great opening uh, for Piotr Glogowski has in fact come to fruition here and uh, he's in a very good position. In fact, he just top topped. Oh, overkill. Yikes. Overkill. Yeah. He even put a land on top. Yeah, well, that, that way you can go for maximum damage, Marshall. You get, you I go see. Reclamation, land on top, float about 3 million mana, and then, oh, not even give him the satisfaction. There we go, that's <laughs> right. So that's going to be a concession there, as Pyotr Glagowski can uh, breathe at least a little bit of sigh of relief here. He uh, picks up game number one in impressive fashion. And now he's just one win away from a top eight here, trying to knock Christopher Larson down to nine and five as we round out the day. This is the last round of Swiss. We're gonna be playing our top eight next weekend. You'll get a chance to uh, dive deep on the decks and the players uh, in between now and then. But of course, the seats are still open. Six of them have been filled thus far, we believe. And that means that there's, uh, there's two left. And uh, one of those could go to Piotr Glugowski here, potentially. And... Uh Chris Larson knew exactly the cards that he wanted to bring in. Of course, he already kind of has a cyborg guide for this matchup. Now, maybe not as familiar playing against this specific build because this is the four color reclamation deck. So probably spending a little more time trying to figure out what cards to shave after sideboard. For example, Gogoski doesn't even play the full four copies of Wilderness Reclamation. Yeah, in fact, I think he may have cut all of them in the uh, in the in the in the match that we saw prior. I don't I have no idea what he does against this matchup, but he's definitely willing to drastically change the makeup of his deck uh, depending on how how he sees the matchup. Yeah, yeah, I think be, be, if he expects the games to go long, maybe he just thinks, look, I'm going to have a ton of mana anyways. I don't really need Wilderness Reclamation. Also, if I'm playing against a four-color Reclamation deck that has access to Teferi, my Reclamations aren't even that good anyways. So, you know, I've seen it, we've seen him go down to one copy, go down to zero copy. So he doesn't really value it that highly. Now, in this matchup, where you know that the Jun Sacrifice deck is capable of just grinding you out, 
perhaps that's not the strategy you want to go for, right? Perhaps right. you don't want to go with that plan. I think it might be in his best interest to really just try to win off the power of Wilderness Reclamation and just go for gigantic expansion explosions. That does seem to be the case. He's left all three of them in the main deck. And you see Ooh. the Cinder Vines in hand there as well for Christopher Larson as he has brought in ways to deal with it. Needs a green source. Oh, does boy. He? Is he going to keep this? I, it, it might be one of those things where he's, you know, this matchup isn't great. Maybe I just, if I, if I can draw my forest. Okay. No, he didn't. He did not talk himself into that. We've all been there before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this hand is terrible too, right? He doesn't even have a black source oh, to, no. to, to, to cast his Agonizing Remorse or Woe Strider. So now he needs a black source to be able to interact with his opponent. And wow, we are down to five. He goes. This is a keeper. But this is a brutal scenario now for Christopher Larson, especially considering that look at Canister's opening hand. He needs a green or a blue source to get that growth spiral down, and he could have a turn three Wilderness Reclamation uh, left unchecked if he gets to find that mana. Look, look at that sample there hand, by the way, Lugowski. We see Growth Spiral and Justice Strike in the same deck, you know? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there you go. The man is good. It was a fabled passage off the top, which actually doesn't allow Glogowski to play the growth spiral here. It is potentially his fourth land, uh, or the third land in this case, uh, for, for the wilderness wreck if he can hit one off of spiral, but it does prevent him from uh, being able to do so on turn three. And interesting to see here that Piotr Glogowski actually still chose to keep in mystical dispute in this matchup despite playing against a deck that doesn't have blue spells in it, because the two of the most important cards in this matchup is Corval, Faker's King, and mm -hmm. Bolas' Citadel. And Glogowski needs to make sure he has answers to those cards, and Mystical Dispute just might be the best, best answer for those. Well, Christopher Larson's gonna try to get himself some action going here with Gilded Goose, Trail of Crumbs, and now a Mayhem Devil in hand, but it's slow. It's just not coming together quickly enough for him as Glagowski now, especially if he finds a land here, well, it was an Uro, that might even be better. Yeah, but I mean, to be fair, this is an awesome mulligan to five. I mean, look, at how, many, look at how many permanents Chris Larson has in play on turn three, right? Yeah, He's got it is eight really permanents. good. Mm -hmm. This is big time here too. If Klogowski goes for the Uro, he really needs to hit a land. Oh yeah. To keep this draw going. Oh, oh he no. hit another Wilderness Wreck. Oh, He's gonna no. miss it here. <laughs> oh boy, Bolas is Citadel off the top. And wow, Larson can almost cast that here too. Yeah, so, so he can sack the food. He can sack the food for mana, act, uh, try to hit a land off the Trail of Crumbs. He can he can also he can do it again with both of the Gilded Goose. Then he can play Solemn Simul Simulacrum. So he's gonna have lots of cards here. I mean, he he basically effectively has unmulliganed at this point. Boy, and Pyotr Glagowski may have just mulliganed to one. I mean, he's got seven cards in his hand, but he can't cast them. Yeah, and and now I mean, look at this. Chris Larson is Chris Larson can just slam Bolas the Citadel next turn if Pyotr Glagowski taps out. Oh, and look at this. I mean, Ugh. stuck on land. I mean, look, this was a mold of five. And, and, and I mean, he had the growth spot. Is Larson going to win this off of a mulligan to five? I mean, this is incredible. And now Glagowski has to represent counter spells here. He has Mystical Dispute in his hand by discarding his scavenging news that he could actually cast because oh, he knows that goodness. he needs it. And, and right now, you're, Chris Larson is not going to go for a bolus of Citadel. No. He's, he's just going to run out the Mayhem Devil, try to eke out some advantages here. Glagowski has a really slow start here, just going to get him for the Solemn Simulacrum. And I mean, Larson's looking pretty good here. <laughs> and Glagowski's going to start rolling with the emotes as well. <laughs> pretty funny. But Larson can play, you know, he can develop his mana enough to play around Mystical Dispute. The real question is, can he apply enough pressure to force Glagowski to do something? Because if Larson wants to sit here and wait until he has enough mana to pay for Dispute or something, that's fine. But then it may just mean be in the gate or something that gets him anyway. And if he's not applying pressure to Glagowski, then that could go horribly wrong for him. So getting this Mayhem Devil down seems really important. Yeah, definitely. 
So now because now he has a board that can just win the game on its own. So Glagoski must do something. Yeah, I mean Glagoski really needs to be able to hit a land so he can go wilderness oh transformation. My. He missed on just both. Just, yeah, I mean at this point, I mean, like he can he can he can get the mayhem devil off the battlefield, but like Chris is going to be so far ahead in cards. And keep in mind, Glagoski is not a stranger to this deck. He won a Mythic Championship playing Jund Food. He did. That's right. But now he's in a really tough position because, as you mentioned, he can use Justice Strike or uh, Ether Gust, but that would leave him with just one mana available. And then the green light for Christopher Larson is slam Bolas' Citadel and go to town. And he will certainly do that if given that option. So now Glagowski's probably going to have to pass, discard another card, and go for that one of those plays on oh, end step. Oh no! Is, is he going for a main phase cycle to not miss land drops? Well, this—I mean, this is it. I mean, we're gonna see a resolved Bolus to Citadel. He, oh my goodness! That's Still no game. land. No yeah. land. He just missed it the whole entire <laughs> time. And now we're gonna see Bolus's Citadel hit the battlefield, and this game is over. There is just no <laughs> way for Piotr to come back from this. Chris Larson just looking for looking for extra. It's interesting because he might want to keep the Gilded Geese back in case somehow the Bolas Citadel might whiff, right? So that gives sure. him additional cards to look at yeah. by having access to Gilded Goose plus food. Yeah, Trail oh, here of Crumbs we go. lets him go off. And here we Which go. Bolas is sitting out on the battlefield, <laughs> agonizing remorse. Let's see what you're working with here. And that's going to be oh, the scoop man. there from Pyotr Glagowski. He says, I'm not going to show you how I sideboarded. Thank you very much. <laughs> and game number two goes to Christopher Larson on a mulligan to five. Wow. Whoa, baby, that was a great win for Larson. What a multi five. My goodness. And that's what you need to happen, right? It needs yeah. to go well for you and poorly for them to pick up a win. And that's exactly what happened here. A miserable draw for Canister. Horrible stuff from him. Never having hit his fourth land, even after going through multiple cards with Uro and Grow Spiral on top of his draw steps. Brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously we're looking at a completely different game if Kulgowski was able to find land number four and play that Wilderness Reclamation. Yeah, I mean, I think we wouldn't even be looking at a game anymore, Paul. We would be looking at yeah. Canister saying, that was a sweet win. <laughs> <laughs> I made the top eight because, yeah, he had it all. I mean, yeah. it looked like it was over, honestly. All he needed to do was hit a land out of like four draw steps and he couldn't. Yeah, it would have been, it would have led to such a huge tempo swing because he had Ether Gust and Justice Strike in hand. So being able to go Reclamation Gust plus Justice Strike, I mean, mm -hmm. any momentum that that Chris Larson was going to build up would have all been decimated just from that sequence. Right, and then it was one expansion explosion from having an answer to everything for the rest of the game. And uh, wasn't to be, though. It was, in fact, Christopher Larson, who, very disciplined, by the way, making those mulligans. The first one was pretty easy. The second one, you know, it's what, you know, we talked about it, Paul. You can sometimes talk yourself into a bad keep, like, well, you know, if I... <laughs> I hit a, if I hit a swamp, I can remorse, and I've got this thing. But that hand was just too bad with the two copies of Bolas of Citadel and no black sources at all. Yeah. No, and, and he got really rewarded there. I mean, uh, that, that second hand, I mean, even if he drew a black source, it still just didn't do a whole lot. So it was, it was a little bit on the slower side. So uh, and, uh, really getting rewarded here, just trying to find the, the optimal combination of cards to really put enough pressure for, uh, for Piotr. I think, I think finding basically Gilded Goose plus Trail of Crumbs will just go a long way because Piotr's deck just doesn't have a whole lot of ways to actually kill a Gilded Goose. Okay, let's get into game number three of the last round here. This is round number 14. Ooh. Hmm, that's miserable. That is not a good hand. You have... You do have interaction for the first two spells of the game. Because you can you can lead with the Triome, play the Stomping Ground, so you can go Justice Strike into Mystical Dispute and then hope to kind of get there. Boy, that seems rough. I mean, Justice Strike doesn't kill Gilded Goose, oh, I guess. And this oh, hand isn't as... Yeah, he molded, and that hand isn't especially great either. Now he's going to need to find some lands here, get that... He needs to find at least the land to be able to play that Uro on three and then hope to hit another land for that Wilderness Reclamation. 
Okay, well, let's see what happens because looking at Christopher Larson's hand, he does have agonizing remorse, mm. which means that he'll be able to get rid of Uro here. And this, if Piotr doesn't just naturally find lands, this could get very ugly for him. Mystical yeah. Dispute was the draw, but he did not hit a land. And we're going to see Agonizing Remorse resolve here. And I'm assuming you just take Uro. Yeah, if you take the Uro, Piotr is so far behind. Right, he just has nothing going. Nothing going at all. Yeah. Like the way Piotr claws back into this is it, it is if you let him keep the Uro, he top decks the land, plays Uro into land number four, which then really puts him in a de decent scenario where he can hit land five for Kenrith or run out Wilderness Reclamation. Right. And we've seen that, right? I mean, that's kind of what Uro's job is in these decks is to bridge you from one spot to the next. I, I, I'm sure I, I'm sure ch ch chat is always on the side of uh, look, look to make sure your opponents don't hit their land drops. Oh, wow. Yo, okay, yeah. so, so he actually went for the reclamation there. Interesting. So now if Klagoski can find a land, ugh, it's an oh, ether gust. No. come on. Not like this. Not like this indeed. And we're gonna see this cat come in and then do you even play the devil or do you just play the goose? We know about the ether gust in hand. Yeah. Yeah, he's just gonna run out the devil and say, sure. When he does keep it on top because he can double spell next turn. Okay, there's a land. Okay. And there's Uro. Does he find a land? Ooh. No, no, not even close. And now, I mean, I, I, get, I, get, I suppose Canister does have Ether Gust, so he just really needs to find a land here. Find a land here, play it. Nope, nope. That it's just a strike that he doesn't have either color for. Not close at all. And look at this, it's Witch's Oven as well. So now he's got a beautiful combo here with the Cauldron Familiar, the Mayhem Devil, and the Witch's Oven. This clock is going to get very quick. Yeah, I mean, th that whole exchange of being able to sacrifice the Cauldron Familiar and sacrificing a to sacrificing the food to get it back is just three damage every turn. Corvold ready to come down next turn potentially as well. Here's Ether Gust number two. You'll you'll likely see the uh, the, the the Witch's Oven combo with the Cauldron Familiar happening here, just to get him for some damage. Before the Mayhem Devil gets hit by the Gust. Mm -hmm. right. And Chris Larson right now is just basically saying, please tap out, Piotr, please tap out so I can I can resolve this Corvold if possible. That's right. I think that Justice Strike might have been the worst possible draw. I mean, Definitely. <laughs> I mean, he has neither color. There's a growth spiral. Uh, and this stuff, I mean, he's got to leave up the Mystical Dispute. Right. He, and but given, it's so rough because Chris knows about it. <laughs> right. But does Chris want to run it into the Mystical Dispute so that he can ensure that his Corval potentially resolves on the following turn? I, I, my assumption is no, because I don't want to give my opponent any cards into their graveyard just sort of for free. Like, I don't want that Uro to come back. I don't know how many cards are in there now, but if there's like four, I don't necessarily want to just throw three mana away so that they can have five. Right. Then the question is, did you want to put the Mayhem Devil on top in the first place if you didn't want to play anything? Right. He could be looking at that one-two punch that you described, though, where you say, if I let you do that, you can't get the Uro back right away anyway. You don't even have the mana. And if then, if you are out of gas and you feel compelled to just tap out for something, I slam Corvold and just win the game on the spot. Oh, and look at this. What the? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, Bulgoski is in, is in way better shape if... Chris Larson doesn't play anything, right? Because then he can just run out the growth spiral. That's right. That is true. That's a really good point. Larson doesn't know about it, but it is important to pressure your opponents here. So he does decide okay. to go for it. And there's land number four, and it is an untapped land. Are we in business? Remembering that the witch oven, witch's oven and cauldron familiar and the, uh, is going to keep rolling along here. I wonder if Chris Larson goes for this Corval, the Faith Curse King, 
And if somehow Glogovsky can grow Spiral into the untapped land necessary for him to be able to somehow cast Justice Drake before the trigger <laughs> goes off. I guess he would still be able to draw some cards given that he has the Goose and the, the Witch's Oven in play. <laughs> he needs to hit red or white <laughs> off the top, untapped, like mountain or plains. <laughs> Look, Marshall. I like how you think, Paul. You could also find an Ether Gust. That's probably a more re <laughs> that, reasonable yes. request. Although at this point, um, I, he's used two of them, right? All right, All right. there it is. Corvo Faker's King on the <laughs> okay, stack. Here we go. Here comes the growth spiral. Oh, oh we God, did. Fable it's passage. another Fable Passage. Wow. Wow, he actually did what you said, hands. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible stuff. Uh, from Canister, he has oh one goodness. Plains and one, one mountain, mountain in his deck. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, that's a bingo. <laughs> jeez. All right, but, but keep in mind, though, despite having the answer here, Chris Larson's still going to be able to draw a few cards here. He can sacrifice Cauldron Familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Draw a card. Mm -hmm. Then he can, he can try to return Cauldron Familiars and put them all on the stack. And for every food that he sacks, he can draw a card. So he, oh, can, wow. he can cash in those food, the, the food that he has in play, four cards if he wants. Yep, and you saw him just put full control on for that exact reason, Paul. He's going to have a bit of a food frenzy here, but he's going to end up with five or six cards in his hand. And the other thing we have to keep in mind after all is said and done here is that he does have Bolas's Citadel in his hand, and the shields will very likely be down for Glugowski at that point. Uh, let alone any other cards that he finds here. Yeah, and, and look, you can even sack an additional food here off the Gilded Goose. Goose. Mm -hmm. So that's an extra card to draw, and... And yeah, I mean, now now the shields are down, right? Like, Piotr Glugowski is out of counter magic for that Bolas of Citadel. Yeah, so even though Corvold only lasted on the turn for half a sec... or on the board for half a second there, it was plenty enough. I guess you could just sack the familiar, yeah. Four oh. cards in hand now for Larson. What did he? Oh, he found Mystical, Mystical Dispute? Dispute. Are you serious? But like, aren't you just so tempted here to just run out Kenrith and, and kind of hoping for the best, right? Like, are you are you really just kind of hoping that they just run out another Corval? Okay, yeah, and he did. He ran out the Kenrith because. I believe it to be the correct play, but now we're going to see some fireworks here. That's right. We could see this Bolas' Citadel win the game very easily. We already saw this happen once this match, as Christopher Larson is primed to cast Bolas' Citadel on 19 life. Oh, man. Uh, if only Glagowski could have seen uh, Larson's hand at that point. Yeah, for sure. You see uh, him using up a food token off of Gilded Goose here, but rather than playing a land in case he hits a land off the top yep. of the library, which Definitely is exactly what happened. Heads up play. And now he found okay. Woe Strider. Uh, and another Woe Strider. Yeah, that's getting close to 10 permanents. That's right. There is Five agonizing, agonizing remorse. Oh my. He did find a Witch's Oven under it as well, so he'll continue to go and add permanence to his board. Is it enough already? Uh, Return to nature. He can cast that too and use the... Uh, card yep. From a graveyard. That does not add a permanent, unfortunately, for him, but... Yeah, I get Uro out of here. Oh! Is that enough? That's enough. That, that's plenty that's enough. enough. Mayhem Devil, I, that, that's going to do it. Wow. Unbelievable stuff from Christopher Larson continuing to uh, run out cards. And he's, oh, he uh, gives him the good game. Larson gives him a little taste. Give out beats, you got to be willing to take them too. So. You got to take the beats yourself. And that's going to do it. Christopher Larson wins an unlikely two games to one there. That mulligan to five. Boy, he won't forget that game anytime soon and finds the victory here in uh, the very last round. Rough beats for Canister there. Won what was likely to be his win and in match the round prior, but couldn't quite hang in there to uh, get the job done. Paul, your lights went out just like they did on Canister's tournament. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, imagine though, right? You 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 lose in, in brutal fashion game one in what's probably not your best matchup. And then you're mulliganing to five, right? You're mulliganing yeah. to five and you're just like, all right. Well, and, and your opponent keeps up. You're like, okay, well, you know what? Let's just see what happens. And he was able to fight and claw and fight his way back. Game two, I mean, I mean, game two was just amazing. The best possible hand he can have. And then game three, I mean, Canister, his, his deck really, really failed him. It really method. did. I, you got a feel for Canister with the the you know lack of lands over the course of those two games. Very rough. All right. Well, we're going to take a short break, but when we when we uh, come back, we'll have more here from the Players Tour Finals. Don't go anywhere. It is the finals, and it is getting real exciting down there. This one was looking like it was going to be over. One, two, three punch for. Uh, to Ralph Zevran from Germany, but not so quickly, says Alvaro uh, Fernandez Torres. He was mulliganed to five, down two games in the sideboarded games, and somehow found a great draw and a win in game number three. It is now two games to one in favor of Severin. He's calm and cool. He's looking through. He, he got exactly what he needed to combat this excellent draw from Alvaro Fernandez Torres. Can he finish? He has walking ballista. He has walking ballista. So I think that's it. I think that just... Does that, he have enough mana? I think, well, he's not going to win right now. But like I said, Torres needed land plus ballista over the course of the next two turns. And this should lock it up, right? Because if You're he draws right. land, he's not going to have the ballista. So I think Torelf just has it here. There it is, a 5-5 walking ballista, and there's really no way out here for Alvaro Fernandez Torres. It was simply too much from Taralf Zevran over the course of this match. Alvaro fought hard, he fought long, but he is way too far behind to come back now. And surely Zevran is on the brink of victory here in Barcelona. He's thinking about a card he could draw, but Damping Sphere certainly isn't it. And that's going to do it. You have your champion, <laughs> Toralf Zeverin. He looks over at his cheering section, and he's your champion. Oh, my goodness. One damage. He got down to one life. And he survives, turns it around. Ulamog exiling two key permanents in two of these games. And his friends are mobbing him. Look at that. Riley gave him a kiss on his head. They're all so excited friends. for Toral <laughs> Zeverin. <laughs> And welcome back to coverage here of the Players Tour Finals. I'm Marcel Sutcliffe, that's Paul Chion. And boy, we've had some excitement down the stretch here, but we've got more to bring you. Let's head down to the feature match right now where we have Ben White playing against Andrew Beckstrom. And uh, right now, as we join the match, Ben White has just won the first game. So he's up one game to zero over Beckstrom. And if you look on the left side of your screen, you can see that Ben White has a better record. He's 10-3-0, meaning a win here, winning this game or the next one, would put him into the top eight. For Andrew Beckstrom, he's going to have to win and then cross his fingers to see if he could make it into the top eight, perhaps on tiebreakers or something like that. But uh, he's got a long road to go here, Paul. He's got to win back-to-back -back games against Ben. And a real note, by the way, the two of these players have been teammates in the past. And taking a look at their deck list, I think they teamed up for this event as well, because they are playing basically identical deck lists. Does seem to be the same, doesn't it? Slight differences in sideboards, but... Uh, one, 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 it's one glass casket versus one chemistry's insight, I believe, okay. is the one difference. Well, there you go. Somebody took a stand, you know. <laughs> All right, well, we are looking at the four color reclamation mirror match oh. here. Andrew Beckstrom missing the land here from the growth spiral. Oh no, not not like this. Well, if he finds a land, he can there slam you go. the wilderness reclamation. He did indeed. And he has <laughs> Dovin's Veto and Growth Spiral available. All of a sudden, his hand looks, his hand looks great. It's funny, it went from like he might just have lost to now he's slightly ahead. <laughs> Andrew just wanting to continue to get some extra mana on there on the battlefield. Really nice timing here by Ben White's on the Ether Gust now, uh, because the presence of uh, Wilderness Reclamation does threaten to kind of uh, allow Andrew to run away with the game. 
but given that Ben has access to the Dovin's Veto, he was trying to set up the, Do the Aether Gust into Dovin's Veto line. Be Beckstrom also seeing that that was very likely to happen, just wanting to draw additional lands, choosing not to keep Reclamation on top. Interesting, he just let it go entirely. I was already thinking, well, do you recast it here? But he was <laughs> one step ahead. He's like, I don't even want to draw the thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not a spot that you want to be in if you're Andrew, where, you know, one of your more powerful spells, one of the spells that your opponent really has to respect isn't a card you want to put on top of your library. But there you go. When you're missing your land drops, you do what you got to do. Andrew, hoping to see if he can find another white source there so he can go double Dovin's Veto. His mana currently did not allow him to cast two Vetoes. So... Now, Ben White, I wonder if he's just going to run out to Fairy here and just hope that there's no mystical dispute in Beckstrom's hand. No, nope, like he's going to stay patient. He wants to have Veto up, it looks like. That makes sense. If he goes for it here, it won't work out for him, though, will it? He's just going to get vetoed. Yeah, but you know, this is actually not a horrible time to go for it. Keep in mind, Beckstrom just chose to shock and passed. Hmm. Which mm -hmm. generally is a sign that your opponent is going to cycle for a giant shark typhoon. Right. So uh, better to kind of put your opponent in an, in an awkward position where they kind of are forced to counter your spells so that they can't actually make a giant shark token, which currently Ben doesn't have an answer to deal with. Yeah, and there's only so many vetoes, right? I mean, right. It, it, those are going to do the thing that they do. There's no hand disruption. There's no other. You, you do have to work through them at some point. Yeah, and he's fought through two so far. There's only three in, uh, in both of the decks, so. Yeah, two main, one board for these players. Beckstrom now getting his shark attack on. He's got a pair of 2-2 two -two sharks blasting in here. He's got Brazen Borrower and Expansion Explosion, and he has drawn another copy of Wilderness Reclamation. Is it time to run it out? Yes, it is. And Ben White's really doesn't have a choice. He's got to play Dovin's Veto on it. And look how quickly... Ben White's uh, resources have been whittled down. He just has Uro and the Spectral Sailor. Oh, and another oh. Teferi off the top. Hello. Yeah, yeah. That, that was certainly a solid draw off the top. Although he is in a position where if he does play Teferi and bounce one of the shark tokens, I mean, Teferi's going to be at one. And mm -hmm. then he has to make the decision that he wants to chump lock with Spectral Sailor just to try to keep Teferi alive. He should just find his, his one copy of Brazen Borrower here. Oh yeah, off the Teferi. That, That's. I mean, that, that would be ridiculous. Yes, if he if he went bounce token, find Brazen Bower, bounce other token. Yeah. Womp. It is a Triome, but he can now cast Uro from the yard. It looks like. So this does give Beckstrom the ability to explosion to ferry down, but that also means that. Ben would be able to get an attack in with the Uro. So he might actually still just go for the bounce on the Uro to prevent the Uro from kind of letting the game get out of hand. Yeah, that bounce is so powerful on the Uro. And look, he drew his Chemister's Insight. <laughs> this is the one card that Ben White's does not have access to. So maybe they had an argument about it during testing and one of them stomped their foot and said, no, I'm playing the third glass casket or the fourth glass casket. And Bexner said, no, we need to have a chemist's insight. And we'll, we'll see who's right here, won't we? This is a thing here for Ben, really trying to decide, do I want this Teferi in play or do I value the Spectral Sailor? I mean, given that he doesn't have a whole lot of action in hand, right? He just has a couple of Uros. Maybe he just wants the Spectral Sailor and try to win off the card advantage provided by that. Now, I would be surprised if Andrew doesn't go for the bounce here on the Uro while currently Ben is tapped out. I think, I think you just kind of have to go for it here and just hope that Ben can't punish you here. Look at that hand. <laughs> Tri triple Uro? Yeah, not quite as good in multiples. I guess they kind of help feed each other. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's not great in multiples, but I mean, if, you're, if your turn is cast three Uros, I mean, you gain nine, yeah. you draw three. It's not the worst. The drawing to fairies. He so, really is. Nice one here. Get that shark off the battlefield. Play another Uro. But now, but now again, Ben is, so many times we just see players tapped out here, but anyways, Ben is tapped out now. So now 
and Andrew Beckstrom has the ability to cast an explosion for four to try to claw back in terms of the resource game here. Seems like a pretty good opportunity to get the ferry off the battlefield. You Could also go for goes. the special. Mm -hmm. Getting very interesting here. Beckstrom with that copy of Chemister's Insight can see a way forward, right? This explosion and then the Chemister's Insight, he's going to have cards in hand. It's just a matter of not falling behind far enough and being able to actually deploy them. So he does kill the Spectral Sailor, allowing Teferi Time Raveler to hang around. And here comes the King. It is time. I, I, I like this. Like Both players are playing this like really elegant dance of keeping up counter magic, killing the Ferris. <laughs> and then just, just seeing there's a second time Ben White's like, you know, what? I'm just slamming the King down and just deal, you know? Exactly. <laughs> Sure, but like honestly, a lot of the cards don't match up very well against Kenrith. <laughs> and there's the fairy time raveler now for Beckstrom. That's gonna draw out a Dovin's veto from Whites though. Right, but now even even if Beckstrom has the ability to play Uro from the graveyard, I mean Kenrith again, you can add additional counters to it to attack through Uro. That's right. And that's where Joel Rail may come in handy as well, or maybe the cat token that she's going to produce here. But one way or the other, Kenrith is a massive threat. The ability to get plus one, plus one counters and trample somehow being the difference here. Yeah, doesn't quite have enough to just cast the Uro immediately. And land, land. One off the growth spiral, one off the draw step. If you can Uro now. The question oh, is if he can the, Uro now. Does he have enough? So he can Uro, give everything haste, then he has the ability to put two counters on his creatures, which would be 13 damage. Beckstrom yep. has four toughness, so he would go to one if he oh chose to pump all, all his mana into the counters. Now, he might not necessarily go ahead and do that. Yeah, the difference between three and one here might not be relevant, but wow. He, he might be more interested in finding... He might be more interested in finding some kind of counter spell. Yeah, he could he could draw a card or something like that. So yeah, then they come. Mm -hmm, exactly. Growth Spiral was what was hit off of Uro. And again, as Paul mentioned, this is 11 damage coming across. So there are force blocks here. Yeah, he must block. Beckstrom in a lot of trouble. I mean, he has to deal with both of these threats. He's got the Teferi, but remember Kenrith, I mean, even if you bounce it, you can just replay it and give it haste. That's right. And if you bounce Uro, similar can happen depending on the graveyard situation. This is getting very tight here for Andrew Beckstrom. Down a game to Ben Whites. Ben is the one who's in position to make top eight with a victory here, though. Ben came into the round at 10 and 3, where Beckstrom was at 9 and 4. Yeah, and also keep in mind. Ben has a Teferi on three in play, so he can use the Teferi to get this to uh, Uro off the battlefield. That's right. Beckstrom's at six, but he's gonna oh, give the good ben game, Wester. and Ben White is gonna pick up that top eight here. He's gonna improve to 11 and three using the same list that Andrew Beckstrom did, and of course they played against each other in the last round. That's just how magic goes sometimes, but it was Ben White who won. He's going to advance to the top eight. So fantastic job to Ben White and uh, impressive stuff from both of these players for sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just really good to be the king, right? We've seen Ben White just kill people left and right with this Kenrith the Return King. So many people looking to play the flash instant speed game with commence the end games and drawing cards of Spectral Sailors. Well, guess what? I'm just going to tap out, play this five mana white legendary creature and just just obliterate you with, with this one creature. That's right. Well, there's a whole lot going on in the rest of the tournament. The top eight has taken form as well as the rest of the top 16, which is really important for this. So with all those news and updates, let's head over to the desk. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much. Welcome back to coverage of Players Tour Finals. Thank you so much, Marshall and Paul, for that awesome last match. Cedric, how are you doing? Two days of awesome magic here. 
from the comfort of our own homes. I'll tell you, I'm doing pretty darn good, especially, especially when you get to watch those last two matches with so much on the line. Have Marshall and Paul bringing them to us. Fantastic job and four fantastic players vying for just two spots. And now we get to unveil that news. Yes, it is time to reveal our top eight here in the Players Tour Finals. Let's find out who they are. Congratulations to the following players. Ben Whites, Alan Wu, Patrick Fernandez, Riku Kumagai, Michael Jacob, Christoph Prinz, Raphael Levy, and Christopher Larson. That is your top eight here for the Players Tour Finals. Cedric, your thoughts? Pretty unbelievable stuff, truth be told. You know, to see the players that we have in this topic, you know, we had Alan Wu kind of dominating this tournament for a very long time. We saw Michael Jacob do his own thing, not playing nearly as much magic as he used to, not streaming magic as much as he used to, and then bringing his own off the wall brew in Mardu Winota. Uh, Raphael Levy, the seasoned veteran, uh, as Riley would put it, uh, still showing that he can do it and doing it his own way with Azorius Control, a companion deck based around Urian. And then Christopher Larson, last one in, winning his last match over Canister, and then of course having to cross his fingers and hope the tiebreakers go his way, which they did, so he's into the top eight as well. It is, uh, it is a varied top Eight. It's a very skilled top eight, and it's a top eight we get to watch a little bit later. Yeah, and it's really interesting, too, the makeup of the decks of this top eight. Yeah. If you asked me coming into this tournament, I would not have said we have two four colors and two teamers in our top eight. Mono Black, Mardu Winona, Azorius Control, and Jun Sacrifice. It's such a diverse top eight. Yeah, you know, we, we do have four Reclamation decks, which given how many players played Reclamation, which is a little bit over half the field, we have half the top eight being Reclamation Strategies, not too surprising there, but it's the non-Reclamation Strategies that are a little bit surprising. Again, one of them Mardu Winota, one of them Mono Black Aggro. Uh, it's, it's a little bit surprising, but it's a good thing to see. Yeah, awesome stuff. Okay, some other important stuff to share with you now are players in ninth through 16th place. These players all lock up a spot at the 2020 season Grand Finals, that big tournament coming later this year. Congratulations to Piotr Glogowski, Autumn Burchett, Sam Sherman, Seth Manfield, Alvaro Fernandez-Torres, Austin Bursevich, Ivan Flock, and A2 Patula. Congratulations, you'll be coming back to do some battle later on this year in another big tournament, Cedric. I mean, we call it a consolation prize here, but this is a big prize too. Well, it's interesting, right? For some players, they're happy with this. And for some players, they're not. For Peter Gogolski, he just lost playing for top eight of this tournament and was having a fantastic run. So for him, he might be a little bit sad finishing in the top 16. For Autumn Burchett, starting this tournament off at one and three and being able to rally all the way back, lose what was essentially their match playing for top eight and then win their match to make top 16. This is the highs and lows of Magic. But ultimately, these other eight players, they are going to qualify for that grand final so congratulations to each of them and that's a really really big deal yeah autumn burchett tweeting after that last win never exclamation point give exclamation point up it's true. exclamation point and they didn't and here they are in the top 16. well we've got to find out who plays who right in our top eight well we can't tell you that right now but we are going to tell you that next friday we're going to have a big bracket reveal show you've got to tune in and check it out this coming Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific on twitch.tv slash magic, myself, Cedric Marshall, and Paul will be there to give you the lowdown on all of the matchups in the top eight. And it's going to be important information, too, because a lot of people have kind of constructed their decks to beat very specific other decks in this metagame. So we're going to find out who plays who coming up on Friday. And then, of course, the top eight action gets underway on Saturday. Be sure you don't miss it. Cedric brilliant two days here of this tournament for you what's your big takeaway my big takeaway is how great these eight players are and how great this field was and so to be one of these eight players in a tournament that was so small but with the skill cap was so high no matter the result for these eight players i know all of them want to win it now they're in the top eight but they should all be very very proud of themselves and for nine through 16 you should also be very very proud of yourself of what you accomplished because again it was an incredibly incredibly difficult thing to accomplish so for all of our players that played in this tournament kudos to them for even qualifying for it for our top eight looking forward to having that show and unveiling that and watching you play next weekend and hey it's not all reclamation folks we've got four other decks that top eight so for you standard fans out there we got a little bit of everything go give that mardu winota deck a try on magic arena 
Yeah, I'm super excited for it. Well, thank you so much, Cedric. Thank you, everybody, for watching this weekend. Be sure to join us next Friday and Saturday as the show continues. Thank you. That's right. As Riley that? said, you are yeah, getting a two-for-one. It's the, the Players Tour Ooh. Finals, and it's not done yet. <laughs> See you back here <laughs> next weekend. Bye-bye. Riku has chosen to play in his deck over the more help here. I mean, this has got to be a bit. I mean, I... Yeah. Two sharks going into the attack zone. You're so likely to find relevant spells over the course. You can see the avenues really closing here for Seth Manfield. I, I think, I mean, this is really, really paying off. You're seeing now I would almost rather Omen and try to set up like a Yorian so that you. Here he comes. We're going to get some kitty cats. Yeah, I guess the answer to you from uh, the Simic. Now things are looking pretty good here for uh, Patrick Fernandez as he says, all right, let's go. So and that is going to be the W for Patrick Fernandez. <laughs> Nicely done. What? I will have my cake and eat it too. Thank you very much. See in the gate here. No touchy, please, says Autumn. As Brent looks, I like going face, so. Big ol' explosion for 11. Look at I Autumn. <laughs> I was already looking at the deck list to see how Autumn was going to adjust for...